trout feed on. That's the supermarket. So the logic is if you park out in front of it, somebody's going to come <laughs> in and get something to eat. Yeah. Uh, and just work those work those areas thoroughly. And, and um, depth is probably the biggest key. So your um, trout are, tend to be <clears throat> pretty opportunistic on what they feed. Of course, if there's some concentration of food, they'll certainly turn their attention to that. Um, but a lot of times they're just cruising um, just above the bottom. That's where the food is. That was Phil Rowley sharing some tips on fishing stillwater. We've got one of the best in the world on the show today. This is episode number 34 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I interview Phil Rowley, one of the great stillwater fly fishermen of our time. We get into a bunch of stillwater tips that will help you find more fish. We talk about all the videos and fly patterns he has created and a super technique that was a game changer for lake anglers. Phil talks about his connection with Brian Chan, another influencer in our space, and how they put together the Stillwater app. Don't miss this as Phil and I nerd out on a discussion about the godfather of coronamid fishing. So, without further ado, here's Phil Rowley from flycraftangling.com. How's it going, Phil? It's going good. Awesome. It's going good. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I wanted to jump in here. Um, you know, I know you are known as a stillwater fishing expert, uh, fly f- tying, uh, you know, guru kind of. I'm sure you got a lot more... Uh, <laughs> kind of uh, accolades and all that stuff, but um, I, I was just going to jump in here and maybe just kind of ask you a, a number of questions and dig into a few things. I hope to provide some value to those listening. Does that sound good? Sounds like a plan, dude. All right. All right. Good deal. Um, so maybe you could start off just tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got it as far as the fly fishing world, you know, how you got to where you are now and how you got started. Uh, maybe just bring us back quickly and take us back to where you are today. Wow. Long way ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, started fishing. I was born in England, so I started oh, wow. fishing when I think I was about five years old. And and course fishing, you know, pike, uh, not pike. So well, not I guess they're there, but more carp and rud and those kind of um, fish in in local ponds, fishing with maggots and things like that. It's just vague memories. Emigrated to Canada when I was seven and grew up in British Columbia, primarily on Vancouver Island, um, where just fished with some local lakes. We fished there mostly with conventional tackle and, of course, it's surrounded by ocean, so you dabbled a bit along the shoreline there. Right. And it wasn't until late teens, early 20s, I got into the fly fishing aspect and... In British Columbia, where I spent the majority of my life, I now live in Alberta. I've been here for the last 13 years or so, 12, okay. 13 years. Um, rich still water culture there. Obviously, the salmon and steelhead as well. Um, but uh, for um, the average person, still water fishing was probably the most accessible. Um, and uh, so spent a lot of time on that and just sort of fell in love with it. And particularly with fly fishing, the whole match the hatch and mm-hmm. really getting to know um why fish did what they did and what they ate and why they ate them and when they ate them all those kind of things when i conventional fished in my youth i wasn't much you know you just put this on or that on and somebody said it was good or you hope for the best so mm-hmm. um ironically it was my wife and i were just either dating or just early in our marriage we um were up fishing a lake Cameron Lake on Vancouver Island, which is known for brown trout, and I'd been, you know, sort of dragging around all the conventional stuff, and I remember one evening, uh, the trout would come up to the surface and rise close to the camp, and this guy walked out, uh, sort of, he almost looked like, I want to say Roderick A. Brown, (laughs) he had the wicker creel and a fly rod, and we'd been struggling for the better part of a week, and he went down there in about an hour or so and said, didn't say anything, just sort of appeared out of the gloom, and caught his three or four fish and left and hmm. i'd been like hmm what's going on here <laughs> so the fuel the, the fuse was lit i had a friend who had been pestering me to learn how to fly fish and got me out on a lawn and and uh started flailing and then took me to a uh, river west of vancouver where i was living now uh, on the west coast and um 
took me fly fishing, caught a trout on uh, my first time out and was mm. just consumed after that by, you know, I, I'd never felt anything on a fishing rod fight like that because it's on a dry fly, there's nothing to encumber your, your contact with the fish. So right. it was just, I'm hooked forever. I don't think I've read another book, probably 10 books since that time that weren't fly fishing related. Mm. There you go. Just, off the deep end and gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, awesome. Never to never to return. That's great. Never to return. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, Love. and now you're uh, pretty much speaking around the country and uh, doing seminars and kind of covering everything, right? Yeah, it kind of evolved from that. I, uh, you know, joined a fly fishing club, learned how to tie flies, just sort of went out and fished whenever I could to try and figure it all out. And I joke, you never really figure it out. I think that's the motto of my website is because you never stop learning. Every right. day on the water, you learn, you're learning something new, and that's part of the appeal of it all. It's mm-hmm. it just your appetite's never quenched. And uh, <clears throat> so that sort of evolved. I started writing news, you know, items for the newsletter, the club. I had a concept for a book uh, that turned into fly patterns for still waters because when I started out lake fishing, there wasn't too much in flies directly targeted at lakes that you could find. You know, there were certainly fly patterns out there, but they were – um, all over the place or just scattered, scattered through local knowledge. So yeah. that book um, did quite well. It's still going strong. Um, and then um, since that time, what have we done? I've written a couple of other books, um, working on another one that seems to take forever and ever. With the advent of the internet, there's hmm. a lot of different ways to do. Um, established a good friendship. I've uh, been friends many, many years with Brian Chan. We do a lot of stuff mm-hmm. together. We have a online fly fishing store that caters to Stillwater, uh, the challenges of Stillwaters with flies and indicators and all those Stillwater-specific hmm. tools. We're planning on going through a, big, a bit of an expansion um, on that this coming year, uh, working on a Stillwater fly, a Stillwater fly fishing app that hmm. crunching like mad to get all those tasks done. I do schools with Brian on and off, and as you said, I speak all over North America, fly fishing shows and things like that. I just like uh, interacting with people, hearing of their uh, challenges and their successes and, and learning a lot from those discussions with them, right? And, yeah. and of course, while you're traveling, you get to fish, <laughs> yep, <laughs> which is always a benefit too. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that that's awesome. That's uh, the matching the hatch thing. I, you know, think a lot of a lot of the people I talk to, you know, I, I covered uh, steelhead fishing as well as kind of <laughs> being in or fly fishing, and I haven't really got into a, a lot on lake fishing. That's why I was so excited to touch base with you here because i know there's a lot of questions out there for people and you know matching the hatch is, is a big one whether you're on rivers or lakes but you know yeah. that, that can be you can pull your hair out and not not being able to catch those fish when they're rising in front of you um, yeah or you just coronamids are probably the biggest one because yeah. they're you know for such a, a simple looking insect and as far as the flies when you look at them aren't terribly complex either but they can drive you to fits of rage almost some days yeah. trying to figure them out but it's just a you just got to invest the time and and for me the big thing was actually believing a fish you know early in my still water development that a fish would find a little size 14 or 16 black thread body mm-hmm. fly in all that water you just couldn't believe you know you want to throw on something the size of a Yep. small car <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah they have um, good, just they have so good they eyesight find, <laughs> but they make their living eating the small stuff and once you get that first one and sort of get confidence in the method it becomes kind of all consuming and that's again mother projects brian and i did the conquering chronomids dvd combo we've mm-hmm. got out now and that's been very successful as well just trying to you know pass along our uh, sort of trials and errors onto others so that shorten their learning curve and have greater enjoyment on the water. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's uh, basically the whole idea with this, you know, this interview, the show I have here is that, you know, this is just a different form, you know, different format of the same thing, you know, I mean, talking to you, you're going to put out a bunch of information today and it'll, and it's going to live online for a long time. So, you know, I'm yeah. sure people will come across this and be able to connect with you. So that's a good, um, I was going to ask you, as far as just some general tips, I know you fish for a lot of different species, um, but do you have, you know, for maybe somebody getting into lake fishing, um, kind of a beginner type, as far as kind of just general lake fishing tips or anything you might throw out to somebody new to it? Um, yeah, it's, well, first of all, try not to get, the one thing about, I think a lot of people have with lakes is when they first get to that lake shore and look out there and just see that vast, flat expanse of water, it's it's not as... <clears throat> um, 
you know, it doesn't have the boundaries that a small river or stream would. You know, you can see the other side. In some cases, you can wade across it. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see how the current seams are different and rocks and, and sort of get an idea. If you were a fish and didn't want to stay in the current, where would you hide? Um, it's not always that easy on lakes, but, um, you know, just invest the time and try to break it down into small chunks, you know, mm -hmm. fish at bay, fish, and, and look for, we have the same structure. So I look for any kind of changes. <clears throat> so that can be a change in depth, a change in bottom contour, a point, a drop off, those kind of things. Any okay. kind of little hump or change that's going to attract fish as opposed to just a big flat base. And there are times they'll certainly feed out there, but, you know, so most of the time you're spending working water 20 feet deep or less. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's where a majority of the food sources live. You get sunlight penetration, which on productive lakes stimulates plant growth, which provides habitat for all the different bugs, invertebrates, bait mm -hmm. fish that trout feed on. That's the supermarket. So the logic is if you park out in front of it, somebody's going to come in <laughs> and get something to eat. Yeah. Uh, and just work those work those areas thoroughly. And, and um, depth is probably the biggest key. So your um, trout are, tend to be pretty opportunistic on what they feed of course if there's some concentration of food they'll certainly turn their attention to that um, but a lot of times they're just cruising um, just above the bottom that's where the food is um, we don't get the dry fly fishing um, that rivers and streams are, are uh, famous for mm -hmm. which I guess is a bit of a I do like catching fish on dries but uh um, for the most part, you're going to be working, trying to keep your flies, you know, close to the bottom region and around weed beds and places where fish would hang out. It's, I call it the, you know, remember the movie, the field of dreams, if you build yep. it, they will come. Well, if you find it, they will come. So, yeah. um, you know, and you, and you work it through and, and you just, um, you don't want to sit there all day, but you want to move around a little bit too. Usually if you're, I find if there's fish in the neighborhood, and you make a proper presentation, you'll probably get some kind of positive response in 15 to 30 minutes. So if you're not catching mm. fish, a lot of times it's not that you're doing necessarily anything wrong. It's just nobody there. Yeah. So move around. Unless, of course, that most frustrating of experiences when everybody else is catching and you're not. Yeah. yeah. You. But, uh, you know, you're looking for hatching insects. Um, investing time as you're getting prepared on the shore is a big help. So look in the you know, the long, you know, the shoreline grasses and, and vegetation for insects like dragonflies and damselflies that crawl out of the water to emerge. Look in spider webs if they're around, they catch all kinds of things, you know, mm -hmm. see what's flying around. Look where concentrations of birds like swallows are because they feed on emerging insects as they're flying away. All so right. much like a ocean going fly fisher uses, you know, herring, you know, gulls and seabirds like that to find bait balls. We're using it to uh, find hatches because they can be quite localized. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, those are those are all. Keep your, don't go in there with a fixed, you know, uh, a preconceived notion. Keep your options open. Yeah. And whenever you're out there in the end of the day, make lots of notes because it's those notes, um, journals, diaries, what, informal, very formal, whatever you want to make of it. It's those, you'll start to see things occurring over and over again. It's your chance to sort of catalog them all down because, as you know, as we get older, our memory gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> it seems, mine does. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. No, I was just thinking. So when you're talking about uh, kind of casting and you know different types of um, I guess stripping versus trolling and things like that, do you kind of do a little bit of everything, or do you are you mostly casting and stripping? No, I my favorite way to fish a lake is from an anchored position, casting and stripping and working the fly. Um, mm -hmm. Not a big fan of trolling, um, and that's just a personal thing. Again, I like to work the fly and and um, yeah. Like, you know, just, yeah, it's, just, different, <laughs> it's different. not against, I'm not against trolling no. or thinking somebody's bad for doing it. It's just not something I prefer to do. So, you know, with the advent of strike indicators, that's really knocked a lot of time off of the learning curve for fly fishing lakes. Um, uh, you know, they're, I think some people oversimplify lakes and say, oh, I was just chucking a bobber out and, yeah. and wait for it to go under. And, and this. I guess there's certainly that aspect to it, but there's a lot of, um, when you get into indicator fishing, there's lots of variables and things you can play with to, to make it, um, work better for you. But, um, in simple terms, an indicator allows you to control your depth and have some control over your re retrieve speed. Cause you can just chuck it out there and let it sit and do nothing, or you can, 
retrieve it, either use a hand twist retrieve or mm-hmm. slowly pinch it in or strips or whatever, but your fly's tracking at the same depth, whereas mm-hmm. other cast and retrieve methods sometimes yep. is a bit of experimentation uh, based on sync time, sync rate of the line, sync rate of your fly, uh, the effects of wind, all those kind of things that make mm-hmm. it a little more technical that way. But um, no, I fish floating lines with and without indicators, midge tips, which is a floating line with a short, clear uh, sinking section. A hover line, which I really like, sinks super, super slow, and a variety of different, uh, you know, sinking rate lines, depending mm-hmm. on this, again, it's, <laughs> we could be here for days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's lots, lots of variables. But if you break it down, if you wanted to take three lines out on a lake, yeah. I'd take a floater, and that would allow you to fish, uh, and arguably, if I only had to fish one line, believe it or not, it probably would be a floating line, because mm-hmm. a floating line allows me to fish... Uh, obviously, the dry fly emerger aspect, I can fish strike indicators, and I can fish long leader tactics um, that we christened fishing naked, where you're fishing long leaders, 15, 18, 20, 25 feet sometimes, depending on water depth, and just basically slowly, slowly retrieving that fly line back. Mm. You know, so slow on the retrieve, the fly line, mm. if the water was flat calm that day, it wouldn't even make a wake. Mm. That's how slow you're going. So you're using, you know, little pheasant tails, uh, little prince nymphs. Mm-hmm. Obviously, this method was designed for coronamid pupa and larva fishing as well. So small little flies, scuds, I fish leeches this way. Mm. It just allows you to, con- you know, you. Yeah. it's a it's a finesse t- technique but once you learn it that take on there too is, is a bit like a wet fly swing on a river it's that little stab sometimes mm-hmm. and it's pretty addictive. little pull yeah the other line i would have is a clear intermediate uh-huh. um sinks at about one and a half to two inches per second um with lake fishing particularly with an anchor um approach you all all lakes all, all sorry all sinking lines will get to the bottom it's just a matter of time and most of the invertebrates trout feed upon in lakes are not Olympic athletes. They don't have mm-hmm. jetpacks on their back, so they can't scoot around at 100 miles an hour. So they move slowly and they move erratically. They crawl, they swim, they dart, mm-hmm. and they rest and they move. And if you have a sinking line that sinks too fast, because everybody sees, oh, I'm in 15 feet of water, therefore I need something, you right. know, it gets down six, seven inches per second. Um hmm. It's not a not race good. to the bottom. Your no. fly's lying on the bottom. You can't go slow enough before you're hanging up. So it's better to wait uh, and let the fly sink. Now, if you're trolling or drifting, a, te- a European-style technique known as lock style, it's getting more and more popular. It's a great way to cover water. Um, but you're still casting and retrieving. You use a In lock style fishing, you're using a, a drogue, which is like a sea anchor, a big underwater parachute that right. slows and controls your drift. Mm-hmm. You still – you. That is deployed upwind, and when you position it on the boat, it stops the boat from swaying and controls the drift so you're not spinning around, and uh, you're still casting downstream, Hmm. right, and retrieving the fly. But because as soon as your fly and line cast, you're kind of moving onto it, you've got to have a little bit of an accelerated sink rate so you just don't run over everything before it gets down. Hmm. And that varies on your drift speed, you know. Um, If fish are active... Then you can go with a little faster sink rate line because it means you can pull the fly through the water faster and the fish being active are more likely to chase it. You know, you, that's sort of the way it right. goes. So the, the third line is typically something that does sink fast, maybe like a type five that sinks at five inches per second or even a three, uh, <clears> some <throat> like a six. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a latitude on that last um, sinking line to choose from. But again, that allows you to fish deeper, fish faster. And you can also fish vertically with it. We do this with chironomids, uh, fishing vertically anchored in water. Well, you can do it as shallow as 14, 15 feet. But generally, it's a method we do in 18, 20, 25 feet and mm-hmm. cast straight down and let the fly hang just above the bottom and then slowly retrieve it up. And, mm-hmm. boy, they they pulverize mm-hmm. the fly with, with that. Method. It's, with, it's scary. Yeah, <laughs> with a similar sort of retrieve, just using different retrieve type methods. Yeah, very, very slowly usually. Yeah. We call it dangling. Uh-huh. Um, and I use it fishing for walleye in some of our local. We have a mixture of lakes where I'm in Alberta with trout and uh, others, and then lakes that are more walleye pike focused and you know the the walleye fishermen with their gear you know jigs and stuff kind of look at me pulling up with a fly rod but uh, fly yeah. rods are very it's 
they're not a they're not going to take you into your backing like a trout or anything like that. But it's sort of a forbidden fruit thing. <laughs> yeah. just, you're not supposed to catch these with a fly rod, and then you're <laughs> proving everybody wrong. It's it's kind of fun. And in the warm summer months when they're still chaseable and it's too hot for you know um, for trout fishing, it's too hard on them to you know a they go off the bite and b if you catch one, you're not going to do it much good. Um, mm-hmm. It's a great alternative. So those are sort of the three lines again. Summary yeah. would be a. The floating line, the clear intermediate, and that fast sinker, say a Type 5. And then fly lines are a bit like golf clubs. Then you start filling in the blanks, Yeah. right? Yeah. So, again, you get all the other ones. And uh, I guess when you get really into this, I joke that only the paranoid survives. So you've got everything. Yeah. For me, when I go out, I am carrying probably two or even three sink, uh, floating lines because I always have two rods rigged up mm-hmm. so I can quickly change from one to the other if something – and it's also there's a definite lazy factor in there. Yeah. Uh, what kind of thing? That, are you? You must be in a boat normally, typically, or some sort of. Yeah, like I've, a, yeah I've got. Uh, well, I've got a fair number of them actually. I've yeah. got a ten foot uh, flat bottom boat, a John boat, often yep. called, or a pram. I got a fourteen footer, and I have my seventeen foot with the forty horse on the back and the pedestal seats and the comfort. <laughs> yeah. So you don't do any of the. I guess that you. The, the I, float tubing type of stuff? No, I still do. I yeah. started, you know, for years I used to float tube a lot because uh, you could deflate them, throw them in the trunk of a car. And where mm-hmm. we lived in Vancouver, the Coquihalla Highway uh, put Kamloops within a two and a half, th- Kamloops Merritt area in, within a two and a half, three hour drive. So you could day trip. Yeah. Um, but, and then to save gas, you all pile into a Honda Civic and yep. throw everything in the back. <laughs> and off you go. Um, but I also have... Um, outcast pack 9000 and i've got a new stealth as well um that i like to use um too but i do a lot of guiding in schools now so i tend to use my big boat uh and use an electric motor to get around most of the time and Mm -hmm. i can get two people with me comfortably safely um you know and fish out of a very stable platform yeah makes sense um so yeah definitely uh, you cover the lines i was thinking as far as a rod are there any special things when you think about the the rod you want to get and weights and i mean i guess when I, we're getting into this i'm always thinking of trout but i know there's obviously other species we could be talking well, about here yeah generally for trout you're probably your five and six weights um some if you're in light winds small fish a four weight would work uh, conversely, if you're in heavy winds, heavy fish, seven weight. When I went down to Argentina uh, to chase those big rainbows on Lago Strobel or Jurassic Lake, as it's known in some mm-hmm. circles, um, you're using seven and eight weights because you're dealing with fish that are 15 to 20 pounds, and it blows in Patagonia. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So you need, you know, it's just letting the tool do the job kind of philosophy. Um, but an all-around general, I, you know, for years I used to fish five weights when I was younger and more agile and fitter. And mm-hmm. now I let the tool do the job. So I fish six weights most of the time. I'm a big believer in long fly rods. I use right now my favorite rods, a Mystic 10 foot 3 inch M series rod. It's mm-hmm. kind of a moderate fast action. Um, but I like the long rods because, well, when you fish in indicators from a simple distance between indicator and fly, you can fish. Yeah greater distances even though i use uh, the quick release indicators i I sell and distribute um it gives you the ability to steer and control fish you can imagine from an anchored position um trout have that innate ability to find something to wrap around so when you've got two anchor ropes down electric motor a transducer for a sounder they find it so the beauty of if a fish comes in you know, as it's coming back close to the boat to land and it has those last minute surges, you can use that long rod to basically extend and steer it around and clear those obstacles. Um, you get great roll casts with a long rod. I'm mm-hmm. sure you can appreciate that yep. steelhead fishing. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, reach um, the ability to, it, that moderate fast action, it's got a, so- a softer forgiving tip so it mm-hmm. cushions strikes. Um, what yeah. else? Yeah. Men, no. We end on lakes. What's that? You know, we, we end on lakes. I do. Um, you know, when you're fishing floating line techniques where you've got the wind at your back when you're anchored and you cast, you want to quarter left or right because I'm a right-handed caster. I usually quarter up to the right and make a mend and just let that line sweep and drift down. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great way to cover water with a static or near static presentation. So mending helps because you don't want a big C to form in your line. Right. You want to be, you know, got to be um, tight to your fly when you're fishing lakes because they can inhale and spit in a mm-hmm. blink of an eye. If you've got any kind of slack in your system, you, you're going to miss fish, right? Yeah. So um, 
all of those things come in. You can certainly fish with an eight and a half, nine foot, but most of the serious still water fishermen I know are minimum nine and a half, ten, and, and in Europe even eleven foot. Mm-hmm. Eleven. I had a question today about using switch rods, eleven yeah. foot, three inch rod. Yeah, I was just going right? to say, is that something that people are getting into the switch rods for lakes? Um, more for the length, not for the. Um, you know, you don't want to be using sort of spay casting techniques a lot of times on lakes just for surface disturbance. Yeah. Um, but the length and all the attributes, if the rod isn't heavy in the hand and all that stuff, uh, there's no reason why not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the technology is get <laughs> it's so good these days. It's for a lot. For, well, I don't think you can buy a bad rod yeah, that, for the most part. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It that's comes crazy. Down to personal preference and budget. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> all. I, I definitely love my, uh, my 10 foot rod for sure. Yeah. yeah. That, that's great. Um, so the, the chromie is, uh, you, you want to talk a little about the chromie and maybe some other patterns that you've, um, you know, you've developed over the years. I'm known for, yeah. yeah. Um, the chromie came about, um, when I started chronomet fishing, most of your patterns were, you know, somber colors, blacks and browns and greens with mm-hmm. a little bit of, you know, wire or, um, <clears throat> tinsel wraps. And it wasn't until the advent of the throat pump getting more and more popular where we actually sample um, the throat area, the esophagus, where the fish is just eaten. And and when you um, carefully take those out and put them in a vial or a jar and look at them, a lot of insects, and particularly coronamid pupa, use they trap gases beneath their um, pupal skin because basically that pupal skin is like a little bag the adult sitting so there's a, there's a separation process going on between the adult inside and the skin of that pupa, and that creates space, and the insect's able to trap gases in there that aid in buoyancy, and then when the split forms at the surface, that kind of expulsion of gas, I think, helps fire the adult into our world. Hmm. Those gases make the pupa look very shiny and mirror-like, mm-hmm. and the more advanced they get in their pupil stage, the shinier and shinier they become. Uh, Gary LaFontaine first talked about that in his book, Caddis Flies, when he was using um, Antron and Sparkle Yarn right. to create that with caddis pupa. Mayfly nymphs, uh, Calabatus do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of insects do that. So there, when we started looking at live wiggling pupa that had just been in, you know, the trout had just fed upon, we're like, our flies are pretty dull and somber because most of our fly pattern development prior to that came from you kept a fish for dinner and you looked inside of it, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, all the lifelike qualities are gone. So it started, you know, developing, looking for, I'm going to tie a fly with a silver body and a red rib because a lot of, the reason for the red rib is a lot of chronomid species retain hemoglobin from the larval states. That's what gives the larva that blood red coloration. Mm. It allows them to survive in oxygen poor conditions near the bottom where there's lots of decomposition or in warm temperatures where there's less oxygen in the mm. water. So that's still hangs around so it accumulates at the tip of the abdomen sometimes and what we call red butt pupa and up the abdominal segments so that's where the red comes in and i got to admit the first time you throw that fly out because nobody else is fishing without you're like what am i doing right <laughs> this is crazy and then all of a sudden the indicator goes down and you get a tug and that fly has now it started as a silver body it still uses silver flashaboo mm-hmm. uh, for the body it used to have a wire rib with the advent of holographic mylars that sort of replaced the wire rib but now we do it in the silver flashaboo bodies i do it in one the the flashaboo color code is 6916 i think it's called blue steel mm-hmm. it's like a pewter gunmetal gray coloration right. because when when the coronum is at depth and it's got a little water pressure on it i don't think the gases can expand as much as they can as they get near the surface and it takes a while it's not this light switch kind of process it just sort of accumulates 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 and the pupa is getting starts dark and then it gets progressively shinier if that makes sense mm-hmm. so in that from dark to super shiny bit there's a kind of a stage where they're a gunmetal gray and um, we use that material, anti-static bags that um, um, circuit boards and things like that are popular to use too, but they're not always easy to find. you got to cut them into strips. They're not as forgiving in the hand as Flashaboo. If, if you're a little heavy-handed, they tear and they rip. Um, so we use those for the bodies. And then with, like I said earlier, the holographic mylars, we're using red ribs, green ribs, orange ribs, brown ribs, black ribs, mm-hmm. purple ribs. So the chromie, you could fill up. Yeah. It has evolved into this um, fly pattern for such a simple thing. You think changing a rib color can make all the difference in the world some days. It can. It's just a head scratcher. Yeah. Ask me a lot. 
well, it's what they want. Yeah. <laughs> so first rule, give them what they want. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> we can argue about it later. Um, yeah. So that's how that fly has evolved. And that kind of theory has gone into other flies. I've got one called the collaborator, which is another coronamid pupa that's kind of a burnt orange or summer duck coloration. That fly um, started, its genesis was over breakfast one morning on a lake in British Columbia called White Lake. There was a species of coronamids that came off there and other lakes in that area and probably around North America called the nicknamed the carrot because it looks like an orangey carrot coloration. And... Um, we were having some success, but not enough. So we were mucking around with materials and came across summer duck frostbite, which is a woven material. Now there's other substitutes you can use, like uh, uh, an English material called buzzer wrap that's gaining popularity over here for coronamids. And that sort of burnt orange coloration has just worked for me everywhere, like in California, Oregon, mm. oh, everywhere, everywhere, Western Canada, Western United States. So it's become a staple pattern of mine um lots of other things um balanced leeches i've popularized i didn't invent the balanced leech mm -hmm. um that was actually designed by um, a friend of mine in spokane jerry mcbride who realized that when you hang flies under an indicator that they don't always hang with the correct posture they hang vertically and most particularly leeches move through the water horizontally so he figured out to use a small or a section of a pin with a tungsten bead where you lash that pin and bead assembly onto the shank so it's stuck out in front of the hook eye and would tip the hook horizontal. Yep. Right? And yep. My contribution to that process was using small up eye jig hooks because if you're not careful, uh, when you tie on a standard down eye hook, you get kind of involved with tying the fly and you forget about the hook eye and totally obscure it. I always joke, oh. those are the ones you give away to friends. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the cues you've never given you any flies. Um, jig hook simply, when the fly's done, it sticks up above. Um, the body so you can tie the thing on it's just a practical application mm. and it used to be we could only get those jig hooks in number 10s but with the popularity of euro euro nymphing oh, yeah. and those big hooks you know i was catching huge rainbows down in argentina on size 16 little balanced micro leeches mm. and so that fly is um really popular we tie it in a variety of sizes it's not just an indicator fly i spent a lot of time saying it's not an indicator fly it certainly works wonders under there but it's also a great cast and strip fly because mm. you can imagine from jig hook it hops through oh, yeah. the water a jig which is arguably the most effective lure yeah. ever made and it's great for bait fish leeches dragonfly nymphs like we tie with the as soon as we had the access to more different sizes of jig hooks now all of a sudden anything was possible hmm. all right damsels mayflies you could balance anything right right yeah um, so it's it's had a real and i use them nymphing on rivers like i like to euro nymph a lot as well and um it's a great fly to nymph on a river particularly just after runoff when everything's been scoured up and you've got crane fly larvae and leeches and all kinds of things tumbling downstream and mm -hmm. leeches are just a good and it's a good streamer pattern to cast and strip too because it pops and jigs right mm -hmm. so. nice nice wow that's yeah those are awesome tips um what's the um just thinking about i guess changing here a little bit on uh thinking about more specifically to fly tying um, mm -hmm. I, I guess you've you've definitely tied up a number of different patterns do you have any um you know i get a couple of common questions from a lot of people that are getting started and struggling a little bit. And one of them is tying small flies and like proportions. Do, do you, do you have anything that might, a tip that might help somebody that's struggling? I, I mean, I guess, I don't know anything that sticks out to you. Well, the first thing that popped into my mind when I was, it was ironic because I am noted for, for fly tying as well. And mm -hmm. I, when I first started fly fishing, I was kind of like, I don't know if I want to learn how to tie flies. Well, like, <laughs> That kind of went out the window. Yeah. Um, and um, I started after I got reasonably proficient. I had the local fly shop I used to hang around with say, you know, you want to tie some flies for me, right? It's a great way to get equipment. Oh, yeah. um, it's not a great way to make money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I tied commercially. And I, my niche is I wasn't thinking out the market too well. I figured I'd tie dry flies. 
Yep. Right? Like your traditional Catskill style, your sure. Adams, your Cahills, and those kind of things. Um, you know, they yeah. weren't the best business decision because yeah, hackles <laughs> kind of pricey. Yeah. You know, to get the good stuff, you tried tying with lesser grade hackles or, you know, non genetics. And yeah, you could tie a dry fly with it, but you're so frustrated with the materials. They were too short, they weren't consistent, uh, all those kind of things. But one thing about tying dry flies is you learn to tie proportions, right? Because if you don't, mm-hmm. they don't float properly. They tip mm-hmm. on their face and all these things. So that certainly helped. Yeah. Um, and just being using little tricks, I, you know, particularly when I apply thread, you know, to avoid crowding the head, I always leave at least an eye, the uh, portion of the shank equal to the length of the hook eye bare, mm-hmm. right? So I don't start my thread right at the hook eye. I leave a little bit bare. Um, when I'm securing materials up and down like ribs, I may only secure the rib uh, halfway, you know, started at the midpoint of the shank and secure it down to the bend. So again, I've put little proportional goal posts in place. Right. Right. So I know mm. when I'm winding my body, I get to that um, rib where I tied it in. I know I need to be thinking about stopping so mm-hmm. I don't crowd it. Right. Uh, and it's just practice, practice, yeah. practice. Yeah. And really at the end of the day too, I just put up a post on my Instagram account uh, where I had a, you know, a, a, a natural chronomid pupa and I had four flies distributed around it. And the comment was, no matter how hard we try, our flies are never really that close. Right. And it's yeah. good fish have a pretty wide acceptance range because, um, you know, we do spend a lot of effort trying to tie as realistically as we can. But from a human perspective, the difference between a natural uh, insect and your flies that you use to imitate them is like night and day. But yeah. Thankfully, they eat them, right? And I think yep. sometimes their fish is curious or, or um, you know, an optimist, right? They, they wake up every day knowing they have to eat, right? They're not like humans. They're like, geez, if I eat that, it's going to add five <laughs> pounds. Yeah. You know, these pants aren't going to fit. Right. You know, looking, you know, every time you pick something up, you're like, you. <laughs> everybody's <laughs> criticizing you because you're getting too big. So, uh, whereas trout are, they're all about. They're not on Weight Watchers. They're no. on Weight Eaters. So it's all about eating. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, uh, I guess kind of thinking back more to uh, getting back to your your kind of your history and people that influenced you. Is there anybody that sticks out as far as kind of I know you mentioned a few people here already, but uh, mentors or somebody that's really helped you get to where you're at anywhere along your career? You know, I've been a sponge, so anybody that wrote a book is a mentor because mm-hmm. I read everything. I'm just sitting here in my office looking at all the books I have. You know, some I have to admit I haven't had a chance to read yet. Yeah, they've got pictures in them. I joke so. It'll keep <laughs> Um, you know, in British Columbia, there was a book called The Gilly that came out and it was put together, uh, the BC Federation of Fly Fishers put it together and it was just a compilation of different authors on still, pr- primarily still water fly fishing. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's lots of great information in there. You know, one of the people, I never had the chance to meet him, but certainly is influenced by him was a gentleman by the name of Jack Shaw. And he also had a big influence on Brian Chan. Brian was mm-hmm. lucky to. You know, Brian as well has been a mentor, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he he was sort of a a pioneering fly fisher in the Kamloops area. You know, a child of the Depression, <clears throat> and started to um, look at what foods were inside trout and and start taking a closer look at um, fly fishing lakes from that perspective. You know, tying things to that looked that better looked like the food trout ate because most of the flies back then excuse me, were the sort of the traditional loudish wet flies and those kind of things, more of an attractor. And uh, ironically, when he started tying those flies and putting them out for sale, they weren't very much accepted because there was such a breakaway. But uh, he had a huge influence on the British Columbia and perhaps Pacific Northwest um, fly scene um, Mm -hmm. as well. So him, Gary Borger has been a big influence. Okay, I like you know, Gary's approach to, um, um, problem solving, you know, matching the hatch and just mm-hmm. presentation problems. You know, I'm, th- I'm looking at two of his books here, designing flies and presentation. Um, you know, and I see Gary a lot now, uh, through you know, bump into each other all the time at fly fishing shows. So big influence by his approach. He's a great speaker too. He's, mm. you know, <laughs> as a speaker, you're like, He's a mentor in that regard, yeah. right? And, yeah, for sure. You know, to get your message across in a way that everybody's still awake at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> or not throwing anything. Right. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but lots, like I said, anybody that's written a book, I'm sort of you know, yeah. looking at the titles here. Doug Swisher, Gary LaFontaine, uh-huh. um, lots of them. Yeah, you know, and, and books that aren't always 
considered a still water source. I spent a lot of time looking at spring creek patterns, for example, because the, pre- the the fly challenges are very similar, right? Yeah. I find, or the look of the flies is, you know, so uh, lots of lots of influences. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting how it's kind of thinking, you know, as a lot of the stuff I'm doing is, is online and, mm-hmm. you know, there's obviously a lot of, you know, work being published online as well, but it seems like there's definitely still a lack of information out there. You know, I mean, it seems like the bulk of it's still in books and maybe I just haven't yeah. dug around enough yet. Well, but. it's, I use, I'm, I'm, you know, I looked at computers and online as, you know, some people look at it as the end of the world as we know it. Um, <laughs> whereas I sort of, you know, in my business life back then, I, when the first computer was put on my desk and I looked at it and, and that was when computers were like massive. Right. Um, I went, I better get my head around this thing and, and, and get comfortable with it because it's not going anywhere. In fact, it's only going to get worse. And now, if you didn't have a smartphone or a computer, you'd be, you're crippled, right? Yeah. I spend a lot of time on YouTube. I like, I have my own YouTube channel, right? So yeah. I'm a big, um, you know, I, I envy that that's around nowadays because I remember the first fly tying books were sketch drawings, right? So it was kind of hard to even see. And then black and white pictures were better, but not. And now color, and now you've got video, and now you can stop it, back up, zoom in, yep. do all kinds of things, right? That you just didn't have the the opportunity to do in the past. Yeah. So that's had had a big influence. But a, books are still. It's funny of all the things man has created, books still stand the test of time. I remember seeing something on the news the other night that they're coming back, and not in the <laughs> in the younger generation, not the generation you would expect it for, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. books still have their place. I still like a good book. I still yeah. haven't quite got into the whole. I have an iPad and stroke. You know, yeah. minimizing and maximizing and swiping and it's um, it's yep. okay on a plane, but uh, it's you know, not it's not same. something I can cuddle up around the fire. No. Or, or in my office and sort of uh, do the whole scrolling thing. Sort of takes away from turning pages somehow. Maybe yeah. I'm an old. Yeah. Old no. I, I I agree. <laughs> I think I think yeah. Books are definitely not going away. They're there's, it's like the resource, you know, you grab a good yep. book and you want to look at flies. I mean, YouTube, yeah, there's no question. I mean, especially fly tying. I mean, that's that's a game changer because of what you said, being able to stop and pause and stuff like that. But Just search, you know. And uh, search, yeah. I, I mean, it's everything. I mean, it, well, I guess everything's not out there, but I mean, it seems like almost every fly that's ever been yep. tied is, is out there on YouTube. Um, but, yeah, the audio thing is the, the other. I'm not, I'm not into the... You know the Kindle stuff either, but um, but gosh, when it comes to audio, I'm I'm definitely, and that's part of the reason yep. this whole podcast thing idea kind of came for me is that I've kind of you know been into podcasts and just audio versions of stuff for quite a while. So I love the, I love he- doing the, you know, hearing the stories and hearing about people, and you know that's kind of what has been one of the awesome things about doing this is just kind of hearing. Well, this I like thing. them too when you travel. You know, when you, yeah. I drive a lot along. You know, where I live in Alberta. Um, I'm pretty central. I can be in um, West Yellowstone in 13 hours. I can be in Kamloops area in 10. I can mm-hmm. do be out to Manitoba. I do a lot of still water trips out there in 10. But it's just driving, right? And I like, I'm yeah. not, you know, a long drive doesn't, I kind of like it. It's alone time. It's time to think and yeah. come up with new crazy ideas. Um, but podcasts are great to just pass the time, right? Because a lot of those areas, you don't have the best radio reception. There's only so many times you can go through your mix on iTunes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I heard that um, 12 times. So yeah, yeah podcasts are great for that. Yeah, good, good stuff. Um, so uh, as far as we talked definitely a little about, uh, you know, uh, patterns and things like that, are there any... Have we talked about your, if you had to say your three go-to patterns for, for lakes or. Any, That's any? so hard. Oh yeah. man. Because, and the reason I say that it's not to be evasive or secretive. It's, yeah. I, I was down at uh, Kelly Gallup's one time doing, um, he had an event down there and this one guy was just, what fly? If you had only one fly, only one fly. And I couldn't, you know, give him yeah. an answer. Because I don't really make any decisions until I get to the lake shore. And, you know, I certainly, um, I fish a lot of leech patterns, particularly balanced leeches. And in the spring, I fish a lot of coronamids because they're just out all the time. And trout eat mm-hmm. so many of those over the course of the season. It's almost a Pavlovian instinctive response. You can catch fish on coronamids even when they're not even feeding on them, right? Mm-hmm. They'll just, it's like a jelly bean. They know what one is and they'll eat it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, during hatch times, you know, I like fishing damsels and mayflies. So, you know, sometimes my pattern selection is governed by where I go. Um, like for dry fly fishing, I love going down and fishing the lakes around the West Yellowstone area, Hebgen and Quake. Um, mm-hmm. 
because they're so known for their calabatus hatches in August, which is traditionally not a uh, still water month because most of the lower level lakes are pretty warm and yep. it's just not the thing to do. So you're doing other things. So um, doing that, I love, like I say, I love fishing damsels and calabatus, um, leeches, even like fishing scuds and things. It, seasonally, things change as well. There's so many food sources in lakes. There are, you know, chronomids, mayflies, um, caddis, uh, damsels, dragons, two families of dragons, hmm. uh, leeches, scuds, zooplankton. That yeah. was fun. The microspec. So there's attractor techniques we use. There's just so many different um, different things, different choices to do that it's hard to narrow it down to one. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd probably start with a balanced leech of some sort to start with. Um, it's a fly you can cover water with. You know, if you look at a tournament bass angler, they fish those reaction baits to catch a fish, find out where they are, and then build their pattern from there. Okay. Uh, similar logic, you know, you're trying to catch a fish. I, I do use the throat pump, not on every fish, but the first guy usually gets it um, mm -hmm. to find out what's going on and then tailor your approach to there. So I like to keep my options open and, and more of a, despite all being known for fly tying and books and DVDs and YouTube and all that stuff, I'm more presentation Trump's pattern every time. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. You, know, yep, you sure. make it you make it behave and look appealing to a fish mm -hmm. uh, for the conditions you're faced with you'll probably be successful right yeah and still you think size more important than color on lakes or yeah i use four things with flies size shape color and behavior mm -hmm. um probably size shape and these are all important behavior and then color because mm -hmm. color is so subjective depending on suspended matter, depth, yeah. light levels, um, so many. To, and, of course, water has an effect on color the deeper you go anyway. It, you know, it nullifies a lot of colors. Uh, was it the high? The reds, oranges, and yellows first right down to your purples, blues, purples, and blacks. Um that's what you know behavior and still water patterns is twofold for me it's how you animate the fly with your retrieve and the choice of materials so we use a lot of soft mobile things that just come to life just yeah. with the subtle currents that are down there mm -hmm. your boots, your rabbits dubbing mixes that'll you know ebb and flow with the water so it looks alive mm -hmm. those kind of things yeah mm -hmm. nice nice um and on as far as hatches and thinking about it, you mentioned this at, at the beginning but just lakes from um, streams you know the difference there yeah. what are is it just this sheer number of bugs I, what do you think is the biggest difference between um there's just a lot of different choices on lakes um and there's there's food sources that are fall in the hatch category that you know start their life in water and end it you know transition and hatch uh, into the, into our atmosphere um and then there's those bread and butter staple food sources that are around year round so on a hatch chart on lakes no matter where you go regardless of latitude or elevation um you know those things will have a, a deceleration on the process or an acceleration um as far you know like things that are hatches occur at higher elevations later right mm -hmm. or lower latitudes things are hatching uh, further because just things get warmer, right? Yeah. Um, so from the hatch perspective, you've got your coronamids are the first major hatch that, you know, as soon as the ice comes off, they're, if they're like subject to ice off, they're going to go get going. Um, and then you've got your mayflies next in sequence, often overlapped to some degree by damselflies, then your caddis, and then your dragonflies come off. And in the fall, you'll have mating and migration flights. And again, early spring, right after ice off, of water boatmen and back swimmers. Mm -hmm. so that's sort of your hatches yeah. you focus on. And then you've got the bread and butter, or the staples, as I call them, those things that are around all the time um, when there's nothing else to focus them on, on the hatch. So that's things like freshwater shrimp or scuds, mm -hmm. leeches, uh, baitfish, Crayfish, if they're present to uh, some degree, snails, always fun. Um, and again, I talked about zooplankton as well at times, particularly in deeper water. Yeah, nice. Nice. Uh, what is, if you had, you, you're going to go fish and you had your one, one place to go to, your one uh, river, stream, lake, whatever, do you have, do you have some spot that's kind of your, your go-to oh. place? Wow. That's tough too. Or may, it maybe so, maybe it doesn't have to be a specific lake, uh, lake, but just a type of fishing. I or... like the West Yellowstone region. Yeah, I just, you know, very pleasing on the eyes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it is nice. Yeah. 
trout have this habit. And most fish have the habit of not li- living in ugly places. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's uh, one aspect of it. Um, um, I like the, and you know, ironically for that area that gets such pressure, um, the Madison and all the rivers of the Yellowstone Park and all that. The lakes are not all that pressured as compared to the you know the henry's lake can get pretty busy at times but uh so i like that i like the lakes of british columbia around the kamloops region Mm -hmm. um, and up towards uh 100 mile house area north of kamloops northwest of kamloops um, lakes like sheridan yeah i like crystal clear lakes okay find them very very challenging uh, I like being able to see the bottom and see fish, and those keeps you busy when nothing's going on. Yeah, in a similar depth in a in a twenty foot or less sort of depth. Yeah, just yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And there's some, you know, there's lakes that uh, I used to take my family, my two sons when they were young, and take them all the time around the Kamloops area, Tonquin, and late in the middle of August when they were off school. We used to have, there still is coronamids that come off that lake that are um, huge. Like we're fishing ten and eight two X long hooks Jeez. for the people. Like they're monstrous. I huh. I know some some of my friends down in California were a size 14, 16 chronomid pupas, sort of standard fare. They open up the box and see one of those big bombers, and they're like, "What the <laughs> heck are those for?" Right? Yeah. And uh, although they are getting popular on um, um, lakes like uh, Pyramid for the big lo- big oh, yeah. cutthroat. Yep. So. Um, yeah. They're popular too. Did like Argentina, got to admit. I liked uh, uh-huh. fishing Jurassic Lake. To, that's sort of the World Series of Stillwater Trout as far as size goes. Huh. Right? Like they are, there's something about catching a 16 pound fish in Jeez. four feet of water. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> kind of a, kind of addictive. Yeah. Um, wow. It's hard, it's hard to pick favorites. Right? Yeah, it is. And it... one of the things I like to do is do stuff i talked about it with walleye is chase other things like I, my, my one of my models if it swims and eats i'm interested right so i i like chasing smallmouth bass on the fly yeah. i think they're a blast um panfish as well i fish chronomid techniques for crappie and sunfish down in oregon i had a uh-huh. blast doing that um you know keep your options open yeah you know, i sure. think sometimes if you try to railroad your pigeonhole yourself or just say that's all i'm gonna do i think you're missing out yeah yeah definitely no for and for bass fishing you you do kind of use typical bass type of flies or you're just using the same well i find smallmouth have a they have trout like Qual- uh, mm-hmm. um, qualities, right? So they like leeches and minnows, and you know, it's certain they are definitely more willing to come up through eight feet of water and smash a popper on the surface, which yeah. I'm totally okay with. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, it's, uh, I've got a, a couple of good friends down in California that fish and use some of my dragonfly nymph patterns in the, in the Delta and say they're really effective bass flies, right? And mm-hmm. it makes sense. Look at the environment a bass lives in. It's the same kind of jungle that a, a dragonfly nymph would like to stalk through and hunt as well. So yeah. they're going to run into each other from time to time. And I can't think it goes well for the dragonfly nymph. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> He's a pretty capable predator and gets to a pretty appreciable size in the bug world. He's yeah. nothing to a lark. He's just a quick inhale and move on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, dragonflies are amazing. Uh, so we're, uh, yeah, we're kind of getting here close here, uh, Phil wrapping things up. I got a few more questions for you. Sure. Um, so think about, you know, maybe the next six months or so, do you have anything kind of exciting, anything new coming up that we can uh, expect to keep our eyes on for you or anything that's just kind of getting you, getting you going? Yeah. Like I said, I mentioned the Stillwater app. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. We're doing that. Brian Chan and I Stillwater, uh, app. There's a Stillwater, oh, I should know this off the top of my head but we have a facebook um page you can keep track okay. on what now what can you explain a little bit about the, what the app is it's basically uh mm-hmm. you know help people still waters it's a it'll be an app that's um i believe the app developer is going to make it like a monthly subscription kind of app but mm-hmm. what's unique is it's constantly updating um it does not need wi-fi other than the initial downloads mm-hmm. to work so you can be out in the middle of nowhere run across a problem and hopefully we've put a tip in there, a video tip on how to deal with it. So we've got chapters on choosing, you know, on flies, helping you choose patterns and some tying videos as well. Um, We've got entomology. So you see a bug, what's it do? What, you know, how's it behave? Mm -hmm. Um, 
equipment, you know, uh, considerations from boats to reels to rods, um, and of course techniques and tactics, which is by far the largest chapter on all kinds of things to do mm-hmm. with still fly fishing from wow. retrieves to how to fish a point, how to work drop-offs, all of those kind of things um, mm-hmm. as well. So we're looking, it's taken a little longer than we thought. Um, I don't know if you do any uh, filming um, yeah, yourself, but yeah. it's a lot of trial and a lot of error. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know it is, I mean, yeah. You know, everything that can mm-hmm. will go wrong. Uh, you know, and I've filmed a, a lot of television over the years, but mm-hmm. it's just... It's just whenever you like it, anything you're trying to do, it seems the whole world's against you at that moment. Um, so doing that, um, heading into my show season. So a lot of um, speaking at um, uh, the fly fishing show circuit. So summer, I'll be not Somerset anymore. It's Edison, New Jersey, um, Denver, uh, mm-hmm. Linwood, Seattle, Pleasanton, nice. Wasatch Tying Expo. Brian and I will be down there. Um, Boise Valley Fly Fishers set. Um, Pretty well takes us up, um, and a few Canadian-based shows in Vancouver, those mm-hmm. kind of things. Takes you up till the start of the season, mm-hmm. and then from there, it's sort of on-the-water schools. So mm-hmm. uh, Brian Chan and I are doing an advanced stillwater fly fishing school at Stony Lake Lodge, and um, just south of between Kamloops and Merritt, British Columbia. It's a private fishery, um, boats accommodation it's pretty comfy it's a nice way to learn how to fish Mm -hmm. Uh, we're doing another one just up the road in late april um actually the one in uh, that advanced schools in june uh roche lake resort brian and i are doing a little um event there um the last weekend in april uh that's public water just south of kamloops great great fishery um and then i do hosted trips to manitoba uh, each year, uh, Southwest Manitoba has got some lakes they've specifically groomed for stillwater trout fishing. Browns, rainbows, big tigers. Hmm. Um, you know, you got diversity of fish, large average fish size, and remoteness. Uh, a lot of these, that area is not close to anything, so you don't get a lot of pressure that you see on more, you know, lakes that are closer to, you know, big cities. Um, so I do two uh, spring trips there that are primarily chronomid focused at that time, and a fall trip. So we do hmm. that for accommodation food everything um six full days on the water everybody gets through my boat at least once mm. uh to fish with me are these uh, mostly all... people that are pretty experienced just not with no. lakes or just all around a uh, 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 real cross section we've yeah. had some people that are you know very experienced and uh, just come for the great still water fishing and it's a great classroom to teach because for example with the coronamid uh, style focused clinics we do, I do in the first two weeks of June or the last week of May, first week of June, um, you can do, a div- you know, besides strike indicators, we can do a whole pile of other presentation techniques so you can see that it's not just a strike indicator show anymore. It's lots of other things. The way we used to fish coronamids prior to strike indicators that mm-hmm. are still deadly effective and just fun to do and it's always like i said earlier the more you know the better you end so don't get yourself pigeonholed into one present don't be a one trick pony no Uh, one of my morals um so doing all that um and that pretty well takes me right up until you know august is tends to be more personal time and and now with the app going and and keep feeding that there'll be lots of filming and stuff all the time going on with that so and so so growing the youtube channel oh yeah yeah, what's your, what's your YouTube? Uh, what's the YouTube channels, you kind of started out to see if um, people actually care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so right now I'm just over, I want to say 3,600 subscribers or so. Nice. Uh, um, predominantly um, fly fishing. Uh, sorry, fly tying. Fly fishing, of course it's fly fishing. Yeah. Um, predominantly fly tying. But I'm going to start expanding into uh, that'll help support the app and and how the flies and do some kind of vlog style um, Mm -hmm. uh, filming uh, this coming season because I I enjoy YouTube and and it's a great platform for people to interact and learn um, Mm -hmm. through well. So have some fun with that as well. So, um, yeah, lots. I've always got my brain's always going. That's the danger or the fun of long drives. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's great. A lot of things. I'm the same yeah, way. Yeah. I, I I drive a lot too. And, uh, you mentioned uh, Kelly uh, Kelly Gallup uh, Gallup yeah. a little a bit ago. I, I chatted with him. He's he's hopefully going to be on the show soon as well. So it'll be great to get. It's get, a character. He's yeah, a character. yeah, yeah. He he kind of knows a, a friend of mine through a, another deal. But uh, yeah, so this this is going to be good to kind of make connect some of the dots and and go from there. Um, 
So yeah, Phil, I think we're about there. I had one more question I like to throw out sure. occasionally when, when it seems right. Do you have, and maybe you don't have one of these, but do you have a good uh, crazy fly fishing story that uh, you want to throw out to uh, to everybody here? <laughs> well, there's usually lots. Usually it involves me doing something stupid. Um <laughs> You know, that moment, hope nobody saw that. It's That's like, right. Oh, yeah, we saw it. It's like caught it on, no, like catch it on video now. <laughs> yeah, I remember one, and it's it's more about my two sons who everybody asked me if my sons like fly fishing. I always joke, well, they didn't really have much of a choice. Yeah. Um, but my oldest, Brandon, he's 25 now, but when he was a little, you know, he was just fishing, and he was, um, you know, a lot of times you put kids in a boat and you're back in 10 minutes, right? It's yeah. <laughs> It's not about fishing. Oh, yeah. It's about just driving kids around. Yeah. But he took to it like a duck to water. Huh. And um, he was, um, you know, there was, he could have, he could do anything he wanted in the boat as long as he didn't fall out, right? So snacks yeah. were on, bring your toys, whatever. Sure. And, um, you know, we were still in my small pram at the time. We'd sit side by side and he was fishing a chronomet under an indicator and he was constantly, you know, your indicator's under. No, it's not. Yet, you know, you always tell me it's under. Well, one time he said, dad, my indicator's under. And I looked up, you know, with that kind of parent, yeah, sure it is. Yeah. And then, oh my God, it's under, right? So, so nice. he sets the hook and he lands his fish and it's a couple pounds huh. and he's elated, right? And he wants to, you know, kill it and yep. take it back to mom so that's fine you know um, I'm not against bonking the odd fish I don't sure. particularly like fish I don't like all the bones oh, yeah. I like fish and chips um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that quite qualifies yeah. but anyway so you know being a catch and release guy I'm looking around the boat I've got nothing to really kill this fish with hmm. right so a friend of mine comes over his son's a couple years over older and he's got this old axe handle he puts some lead <laughs> up in the handle so his son throws it across you know not you know throw from outfield but you know yeah. like eight ten feet away my son doesn't quite get things coordinated it hits him square between the eyes oh right? jesus staggers him for a second but he's so excited that uh, you know doesn't phase him um and uh let's go show mom so we go roaring back in well roaring as much as you can with electric uh, yeah. and uh you know the boat's just starting to come into the landing you know into the shore to land and he he flies off i must have cleared six feet of water i think holding his <laughs> fish probably my wife goes what the hell did you do to him because by that point his yeah. forehead had come up like a unicorn oh jesus <laughs> oh man mom's pissed she's she's okay with it you know once they explain it right it was pretty funny but yeah, uh, yeah that's probably one of the <laughs> nice. memorable got that yeah. i got a i've got a couple of young kids three and five years old so it's uh I'm excited to get to that. I mean, I'm kind of already starting to try to get to that point. Any uh, any tips from a, as a father to you know kind of have your kids get into it as opposed to uh, I've heard patience. of the stories the, the uh, patience patience no high expectations you know there's my uh, youngest son Sean he's now 22 23 coming up he didn't take to it quite as well but eventually the you know he he thought it was fun so there was a lot more you know get out there i want to go in get in i want to go out you know you're like a human yo-yo you just when you when you had the kids along for a trip it wasn't a fishing trip that you were used to when you go out with the boys or by yeah. yourself the, the gang or whatever um you know and um you know let them you know be with them and teach them and it's fun it's just part of being a parent you know i took brandon to a little lake that if a fish got 10 inches long um that was a major fish but you threw anything that landed on the surface it was like feeding goldfish or mm -hmm. piranhas <laughs> and catching um nice. you know that's because he would be picking up laying down picking up laying down all the time and all of a sudden within about four hours he can cast huh. yeah. now he's cut you know because kids are so they're in that learning mode they have no bias mm -hmm. um they you know uh, arguably the worst students are middle-aged men <laughs> yeah yeah. Because um, they can horsepower something through, right? They can right. just put enough energy behind it. It'll go even though well, it's not quite the right technique. But, yes, it went out 45 feet. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, being patient, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, lots of snacks in the boat. <laughs> yep, yep. No, <laughs> sure, they go to the washroom before they get in the boat because I like to pull that when they're bored. Oh, yeah. I got to go to the – no, you don't. You just went <laughs> – <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, don't take them on trophy hunts. <laughs> yeah, you know? don't take them out in the but, freezing cold for too long. You know, well, some, you know, each kid's different. Like I say, my oldest, I sat through a, one day of just r rainstorm after rainstorm. He had the, you know, he's got rain jacket and everything. He just sat there and took it all in. No kidding. You know, wow. even I was going, I'm not, ha this isn't fun anymore, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're going in. Um, but yeah, patience and, and just adapt. Each kid's different. 
Yeah. Right? You'll, you may have with your children one that's just all over this and can't get enough of it and it's dragging you out of bed at four in the morning to go, almost like it's Christmas Day. And the other one, it's like, yep. come on, let's totally. go. You know, they're going to have fun. And it's those days that they just, they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. Yeah. Right. Now yep, my sure. two whine and bitch at me because I don't take them fishing enough. I'm nice. always off somewhere else doing something. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, so they're still into it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, my oldest was really giving me the gears this past summer. You know, I did a couple. I did a fly, a great fly and pike destination to check out a lodge, Arctic lodges in Saskatchewan, possibly do some schools there for huge pike. And we were getting, we were pulling lake trout up. They were in hundred feet of water, and we were figured Jeez. out how to get them on a fly. So, Holy cow! Uh, yeah, a lot of the conventional guys were like, "You got them on a fly," and we just managed to figure out. You know, the, the way it was working, the drift was so slow one day that we could cast out with fast sinking lines and control the boat because there's no way you can anchor in 100 feet, but mm. control it so the fly line could sink. Mm-hmm. And once you got it down, the, the common way with conventional gear is to jig for them, but a fly rod doesn't jig very well because it absorbs the jigging action. Mm. So once you got it down, then you just start aggressive two to two, two and a half foot strips, mm. and they they just clobbered the fly. Right? Wow. <laughs> You know, That's the lodge awesome. record 60 pounds, so I think we got in the 20s as big as we got. But um, but uh, my son was giving me the gears. How come he didn't get to go? Yeah. Because I took my wife because she was film- we were doing some filming while we were there, too, for the lodge. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. And she's become my camera person. Yeah, that's the, I guess that's the bonus of being, uh, you know, doing what you do. It's like, you know, it's part of, uh, part of work, right? You, you have to do it. But he's pretty such that it is. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Nice. All right, Phil. Well, uh, did I uh, miss anything here? Anything else you want to add as far as, I mean, we talked a lot about lake fishing and any other tidbits? No, just get out there and do it all. (laughs) All right. Sounds awesome. Uh, Do you uh, maybe want to give a shout out to where people can find you again if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, Definitely. Um, Email flycraft at shaw.ca. I have my own website, flycraftangling.com. Uh, you can contact me through there. We have the Stillwater Fly Fishing Store, the online store Brian and I have set up. That's stillwaterflyfishingstore.com. Apparently, that was good for search engines. So yeah. I trusted our guy. Oh, there you go. Um, and YouTube, uh, yeah. just Phil Roley or Philip Roley Fly Fishing Search will get you. Um, social media, do Facebook, Instagram, Twitter to some degree. Um, and then I think that's a about yeah. it and then when the app comes out that'll be everywhere but those are the best ways because okay. i'm always and it's phil roley fly fishing i had the philip roley personal page that yeah. got to five thousand, and you cut off um so now i have a profile page and that's where i spend most of my time now i uh, periodically take a peek at my personal page but uh yeah. everything's on the phil roley fly fishing page um, okay and, and it's flycraft phil for twitter and instagram okay. one's capitalized the other can't never remember which one <laughs> perfect well I'll, I'll uh yeah i'll get links to all this and put it in the yeah. show notes and make sure everybody has a chance to you know when they connect with me i'll direct them your way um and yeah we can go from there uh wanted to say uh thanks for coming on phil i really appreciate this has been a I mean, way more packed than I thought as far as the, uh, the the stuff you went into. A lot of stuff I haven't even uh, you know hadn't even heard of. You know, as far as lakes. Back. Yeah. I told you, you would be able to shut me up. No, it's been it's been <laughs> awesome. I, yeah, we could definitely uh, talk more, and I'll I'll have you back here when I get some uh, some more big questions for you. So, yeah, thanks again, Phil. And we'll uh, talk to you soon. All right, Dave. Take care. All right. See ya. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 34. If you get a chance, it'd be great if you could send me a tweet on Twitter if you uh, use that social network. And we're using the uh, lightning bolt emoji, and that'll be pretty cool to to see some of those come through. That's uh, wetflyswing on Twitter. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you online or on the river later thanks for listening to the wet fly swing fly fishing show for notes and links from this episode visit wetflyswing.com and if you found this episode helpful please subscribe and leave a review on itunes